so, so this talk is titled The Role of Isostasy in the Evolution and Structural Styles of Flow and Thrust Belts. Um, and I'll just get my laser pointer out for my continue. Cool. Uh, so my goal in this presentation is to take this generally well understood process in geology, uh, isostasy, and show you how it could be a little more tricky than it initially seems to implement in a geodynamic model. Um, and then show you how it could be important for the structure and evolution of a full and thrust belt. Uh, so first, we'll start with a short background on isostasy with a little bit of trivia um, and some background on full and thrust belts. Uh, then I'll get into the numerical modeling side of things and basically answer the question, how do we include isostasy in a crustal scale model? Um, and then we'll get into the main event, the, the full and thrust belts themselves. So uh, I'm sure everyone here generally understands what isostasy is. Um, essentially, we're talking about buoyancy and Archimedes' principle, uh, but we're dealing with the lithosphere kind of floating on the asthenosphere. Um, so, so what isostasy is, is basically a vertical response to changes in pressure, right? So, so for example, um, here we have this glacier that's heavy and imposes a load on the underlying lithosphere and mantle. Uh, so we get this response where we get this sort of sinking of the lithosphere uh, with an outflow of the asthenosphere underneath into these bulging regions. Um, so when the glacier melts and, and on geologic timescales, that happens pretty quickly. Um, we're left with a crust that has this profile, uh, but the load's been removed. And because of this change in pressure, uh, we get the crust rebounding back up, which takes time and depends on a whole suite of parameters. Um, and that's just called post-glacial rebound or, or just glacial isostasy. Um, but we can think of the emplacement of a fold and thrust belt as just sort of the opposite process to the removal of the glacier. Um, essentially, what we're doing is stacking a whole bunch of rock and getting kilometers of thickening. Uh, which is heavy and will impose a load on the lower crust or mantle, uh, which prompts its own isostatic response. So uh, first I thought I'd start with a little history of isostasy, you know, some cool trivia you could take away and tell your friends. Um, so Leonardo da Vinci, you know, famous painter with the Mona Lisa. Um, us geologists know him for thinking uh, and writing about erosion and sedimentations, uh, sedimentation, fossils and shells, those sorts of things. Uh, we usually put them into the undergrad lectures and I've built some engagement. Um, Though actually one of the earliest mentions of isostasy comes from his notebook, uh, where he was basically contemplating if the removal of sediment from a mountain uh, would make it light, lighter and cause it to rise. You know, it's written in a bit of a particular way, but, but he wrote, um, the rivers carry away the slopes of mountains and bear them to the sea, uh, is the place from which such gravity is removed. Uh, it will make itself lighter. And then he continues to say, the summits of the mountains in course of time rise continuously. So this whole idea of, oh, we remove a load from, this, from, from, from the mountain right through erosion uh, will cause it to be lighter and, and rise. So another historical mention uh, was in this letter from John Herschel, uh, who was one of the early pioneers of photography and, and actually came up with the word photography, you know, among other things. Um, and in this letter he wrote to Charles Lyell, uh, who we all know and love, um, he basically wrote, suppose the crust floats on a sea of lava. Uh, if, the, if this crust is loaded by sediments, it would sink. Uh, that would cause the lava to flow out from underneath the load into the flanking regions. And he kindly drew this little illustration in this letter to get his point across, uh, where he showed the sediment being uh, deposited in this basin here. So it gets heavier, uh, causing this crust to sink into the lava, uh, and the lava flows out into these heavier, uh, into, into these flanking regions. And then to fast forward a bunch to two scientists who I'm sure you've all heard of, Ari and Pratt. Um, so the story with these guys is Pratt went ahead and calculated the deflection of gravity due to the Himalayas, uh, and he found that it was different than expected. Uh, it, it was less than expected. And he wrote a 75 page long manuscript filled with these long tedious calculations. And he was satisfied that he was correct with his values, but he didn't understand what the cause of the discrepancy was. Uh, so Ari the next year replied saying, well, you know, under the mountain, we would expect to have this lighter crust. Uh, so the effect of the, the heavy lava, he called it, uh, is removed and the reduction in gravity to the light crust underneath uh, would equal the, the increase in attraction due to the mountain above. Uh, so the total effect of gravity would be small. And he was able to sum this up in a three page long paper and use Mount Everest as his example. Um, and Pratt didn't like that at all. Uh, Pratt, like many others at the time, believed in uh, contraction theory. So he responded with his list of criticisms and Ari just left it there and never really returned to the discussion. Um, over the next hundred years, we dropped contraction theory. Uh, both Ari and Pratt's models were useful for geodesy and geodesists. Uh, they both implied that the crust should be able to move up and down. Uh, the main difference between the two is just where the depth of compensation is. Uh, so with Pratt, each column includes only the crust. Uh, 
but with area, it also includes the mantle down, down to the depth of the, the lowest column. And by a depth of compensation, I just mean the depth uh, where, where pressure is equal. Um, so both of these uh, models have their problems. You know, they don't account for any sort of friction between the different columns. They also don't take the strength of the lithosphere into account at all. Uh, so none of the load in this case is being supported by the lithosphere. So fast forwarding again, uh, we landed the lithospheric flexure, elastic plate model of isostasy. Uh, so this model treats the lithosphere as a perfect elastic beam that will bend in response to the addition or removal of the load. Uh, so here, for example, we have, uh, we have this orogenic load. And so the lithosphere uh, underneath flexes downwards where we have this rift. We've got uh, this rift related unloading, so it gets lighter and we have this flexural uplift. Um, same thing with the ice, you know, heavy glacier. So you get this flexural uh, subsidence. So uh, we've got our local models of isostasy where the load is compensated for directly underneath it uh, without taking the strength of the lithosphere into account. And then the lithospheric flexure model, uh, which treats the lithosphere as a perfectly elastic beam and the load is distributed beyond just where the load is. Uh, and of course, this model doesn't account for any brittle behavior of the crust at low temperatures or any ductile deformations at high temperatures, right? It just treats the lithosphere as a purely perfect elastic beam. So the cool stuff, full interest builds. Um, what is a full and thrust belt? Basically, uh, these are areas of localized compressional deformation. Uh, they generally form around orogenic belts, and, and like the name suggests, at their most basic level, uh, they're composed of folds and thrust faults. Uh, and this is just a little animation of a model of a fold and thrust belt forming. Uh, basically, here we're taking an originally horizontal stratigraphic package and just shortening it. And here's a cross section across an entire orogenic system. Um, in this case, we've got continent-continent collision. Um, and here in the foreland, we formed this uh, thin skin fold and thrust belt, which just means the sediments are deforming without any basement involvement. Uh, moving closer to the hinterland, some of that basement starts to get involved, and we call that thick skin deformation. Uh, then we've got the main origin itself. This is the, the metamorphic core with all the magmatics and metamorphic rocks. Uh, on the other side, we have the retro wedge, which is usually pretty similar to the, to the foreland fold and thrust belt, but it's, it's opposite virgin, so it just dips in the other direction. Um, and often you get gravitational related folding and thrusting in this region too. Uh, so people have spent years and years studying these systems. Um, and that's because there's so much variability within them. Uh, these are fold and thrust belts from all over the world. And just at a quick glance, you'll notice that they all look really different to each other. Uh, and that's just because of all the different mechanisms and processes that go into them, right? Uh, it's like a giant recipe uh, and you tweak one ingredient, you get a whole different meal. Um, they'll form under different geodynamic conditions or composed of different stratigraphies or have earlier deformation histories, um, even like the climate at the time. So the amount of sedimentation and erosion during orogeny plays a big role in the overall structure. So uh, we talked about isostasy and then we talked about full and thrust belts. Uh, and now I'll match the two together and you know, we'll get into the guts of the talk. So when we form a fold and thrust belt, we apply a load on the crust by stacking all these thrust sheets, uh, which prompts an isostatic response. Uh, so what we're looking at here really is the competition between two forces. We've got the tectonic forces. So that's the convergence rate of the fold and thrust belt, how quickly we stack these thrust sheets and create that topographic load. Then we've got the isostasy, uh, how quickly the lower crust and mantle will compensate for that load. And also to what extent. We know from post-glacial rebound, the uplift can vary from like two to five millimeters per year, but in some cases as high as 41 millimeters per year. So, uh, what does all that mean for a fold and thrust belt? Well, what if the tectonic rate is really fast and we stack all of these thrust sheets super quickly, but the underlying lithosphere responds really slowly, uh, which in this case, we just call a low isostatic rate. Uh, what would the fold and thrust belt look like if it forms at a rate that's compatible or, or synchronous with isostatic subsidence? Uh, so as we stack the thrust sheets, the lower crust and mantle are compensating for that load as it's being created. Uh, those are the sorts of questions we're looking to answer. Um, and to answer these questions, we use Underworld to run, to run a suite of models. Um, they're all at 80 meter resolution because we're really trying to capture those small scale structures. Uh, and this is the general model setup. And I'm gonna show a whole assortment of models. So the actual material setup might differ from model to model, uh, but generally we have a sedimentary package, which has some built-in heterogeneity in its rheology, um, overlying a basement. Then we have this extra layer here that helps us implement and scale whenever I saw the sea boundary conditions. Uh, which I'll get into in a second. Uh, we push from the right wall, um, and we also have this conveyor belt sort of effect happening, and the rest of the left wall just acts as a, as a rigid backstop. So uh, implementing isostasy into an upper crustal model gets a bit tricky. Uh, 
so to have isostasy in a self-consistent manner within your numerical model, uh, you essentially need the model domain to extend deep into the asthenosphere, uh, which is what I'm showing in the red box here. Uh, though really the part we're interested in is just this green box, so just the top few kilometers of the crust. Uh, computationally, it doesn't make sense to include the, the whole uh, like red box asthenosphere area, uh, because then we can't run it at those high resolutions we need to study these small upper scale crustal processes. Uh, so instead, modelers have come up with a few strategies and methods for including isostatic processes in these types of models. Uh, however, uh, the vast majority of full, thrust belt, uh, full and thrust belt models out there don't really bother with the basal isostasy boundary condition, right? Uh, they're just doing their thing, studying whatever mechanism it is they're looking at, uh, without putting too much thought into, into the dynamics of what would happen when we create these big loads and what contribution that vertical motion would have for the structure of the full and thrust belt. Uh, though there are a subset of models out there that use an elastic beam formulation at the base of the model. Uh, so as the model evolves, you get this instantaneous flexure uh, where the beam flexes downwards towards the hinterland uh, and they're studying their thing, whatever it is, but no one has ever really looked at the nature of these boundary conditions and what one condition over another actually means for the structure uh, of a fold and thrust belt. So in our models, we use two different types of boundary conditions. Uh, we use both models of isostasy we talked about earlier, uh, and we run a suite of models using a, a local airy style isostasy condition uh, and another using this elastic flexure condition. Um, so, so for those of you who have used Underworld in the audience, what I mean by airy style is, is the included Lacode isostasy. Uh, but basically what it is, is a boundary condition uh, which aims to keep pressure at the base uh, of the model constant by applying a vertical uh, boundary condition at the base uh, corresponding to the needed inflow or outflow of material. Um, so to tune this or, or to scale this effect, uh, we've come up with this method where we use this virtual basal layer. Uh, and what it does is control the amplitude of the isostatic response. Um, so the, the density here really is just a scaling density. Uh, and I don't want to get too bogged into the details, obviously I have to discuss this further uh, if there are any questions, but uh, essentially the lower the scaling density is, uh, the less emphasized the isostatic response will be, uh, because more of that material we need to exit to keep the, the pressure at the base constant. And then for the models where we use elastic flexure, uh, with Julian's help, we were able to couple these models with G-flex. Uh, so that's a widely used flexural isostasy model, which, which I'm sure rings a lot of bells in this audience. Um, and we calculate the surface load generated with every model output, pass that to G-Flex, which gives us a flexural profile. Uh, and we use that to displace the model for the next time step and so on and so on. So a lot of talking, but some actual models. Um, so here are some of the models using that local isostasy condition. Uh, at the top, we're looking at scenarios where we have a really fast convergence velocity and a really slow isostatic rate. Uh, which means we pile up our thrust sheets without much isostatic compensation. Uh, and here all the way at the bottom, it's the opposite. We form the fold and thrust belt really slowly with a convergence velocity of five millimeters per year. Um, and isostasy is able to keep up and compensate for the load as it forms. Uh, so I'll just run these all. Um, and all the models have received the same amount of shortening. And this one just takes uh, a bit longer because we're, we're squishing it slower. Cool. And so just, just at a glance, we notice a few things, uh, like the difference in elevation, say, between the top model and the bottom model. Uh, here we've got it up to just above two kilometers of topography. Uh, here we just got a couple hundred meters. Um, and you also notice that this fold and thrust belt for the same amount of shortening is a lot wider uh, than this one here. And that's because, um, and that's because uh, here we, where, we have a lot of, where we have a lot of isostatic subsidence or the isostatic rate is high, uh, we get this narrower zone of deformation uh, as a result of that basement moving downwards. Um, and in that narrower zone of deformation, uh, we tend to form uh, these more complex and wonky structures. Um, so this is a figure of those same models as before, uh, but we color the faults by fault generation. And by that, I mean the time at which the faults formed. Uh, so the purple ones formed first and this, this, this greenish mustard color uh, formed last. Um, and these are the two end member models just side by side here. Um, and you'll notice in this model where the convergence rate was greater than the tectonic rate, we have this nice forward propagation of faults. Uh, you can see the colors gently change from this purple to the green 
Uh, but then when you look at this model where isostasy can keep up with the accretion of the fold thrust fault, uh, the color is more mixed up. You have faults forming out of sequence and at different structural levels. Uh, generally, there's just more going on. Uh, and these are just the topographic profiles for different models. So uh, you'll see that when we increase the isostatic rate, uh, we have lower topographies. Um, and you can also see that, like, so the blue one here has, has the lowest isostatic rate. So it's a lot taller, it's a lot wider uh, than, than the yellow fold just about here. Um, so these were the local models. And we can see that the interplay between tectonics and isostasy uh, does have an impact on the evolution for, uh, for these fold thrust belts. Uh, but what about if we use the flexural isostasy model? So uh, here's a similar setup to before. Uh, up at the top, we formed the fold belt really quickly with a high convergence velocity, uh, but we use a high lithospheric elastic thickness for our beams so we don't get much flexure. Uh, by lithospheric elastic thickness, uh, essentially I'm just, uh, I mean, you can take it as the strength of that underlying beam. So when I, when I give a high lithospheric elastic thickness, uh, it's stronger, it's more resistant to that bending. Um, here we use a very slow convergence velocity, but with a low um, lithospheric elastic thickness, so, so the beam bends more easily. Um, I'll just run all of these. Uh, and you can think of this gray layer just as the elastic beam. Um, and these models are a bit longer, uh, and we shorten them all 25 kilometers. So uh, there are some key differences here. Uh, clearly the structural styles are really different from top to bottom. Uh, but when we run our whole matrix of models, uh, it becomes clear that the change in structural style uh, is really just due to the convergence rate of the fold and thrust belts. Um, here it's a lot more gentle. So we get this really gentle deformation. Uh, here it's the, the, the convergence rate is a lot faster. Uh, so the fold and thrust belt reflects that, that aggressive sort of tectonic regime it's in. Um, so if we take a closer look, uh, here are three more models that deform uh, at the same convergence velocity at a centimeter per year. Um, and the elastic thickness, though, it, it varies from 20 kilometers at the top to 60 kilometers down at the bottom. Uh, so we have a weaker lithosphere up here and a stronger lithosphere down here. Let's run these. So you can see the difference in terms of the amount of flexure right here. We're just at this negative five mark, uh, so we don't get much flexure. Here we go about a, we get about a kilometer uh, of subsidence um, of the basement, though it doesn't mean much for the, the structural style. Uh, they're not that different. I mean, there's a bit of a change in structural style here from these nice forward propagating faults up to these like down to these like pop up structures. Uh, but really, I saw to see here isn't playing a dominant role in the evolution of the fold and thrust belt. Um, you know, it, it'll likely be the, the rheology or whole other assortment of variables that, that are in the driver's seat uh, in, in real life in these sorts of situations. So uh, what, what does this all mean? Uh, we have our two isostatic models. They've been used across different studies, and I'm not saying one is right or one is wrong or anything like that. Uh, I think they're both useful models that represent different geodynamic contexts. Um, so the main difference between the two is the redistribution of mass below the upper crest. Uh, when we use an elastic beam model, uh, there's essentially no or little redistribution of mass or, or horizontal outflow uh, of material beneath the heavy area, right? It's just the vertical motion uh, of the beam. Uh, but when we use this local style isostasy here, uh, we create this accommodation space and, and the material underneath the basin moves to the flanking regions. Uh, so this type of model where we have just the beam, uh, this type of model where we just have just the beam uh, moving up and down, is probably more su better suited to these foreland sorts of regions where we have this colder, stronger, uh, more rigid lithosphere. Um, and then this local style of isostasy is probably suited more to the, to the hinterland regions where we have uh, a weaker, more ductile uh, lower crust where, where, where the material can sort of move out of the way to, to create space for the overlying thickening. Right, so that was just a bunch of numerical models and, and it's always important to look at real world analogs when doing this sort of thing. Uh, so here we're looking at South America and the Andes which have been interpreted in terms of elastic thickness of the lithosphere. Um, and what's interesting about this area is the change of lithospheric elastic thickness uh, away from this bend area due to the geodynamics of the region. You know, we go from values of uh, 90 kilometers of, of lithospheric elastic thickness here in the center uh, to 10 kilometers at the edges. Uh, so this change in elastic thickness along the Andes is, is lucky for us because we can look at fold and thrust belts that form as a part of the same system, uh, but differ in their isostatic response. Um, and these are cross sections from the sub-Andean zone, uh, which are just to the east of the main origin here. Uh, 
Uh, and of course, the, the elastic thickness isn't the only difference between the two areas. Um, you know, so, so at a glance uh, in the cross sections here, uh, you could see that they've had different sedimentary deformational histories. Um, the, the center regions have received a bit more shortening uh, and there might be different detachment levels active. But, but in terms of comparing the influence of isostasy in a, in a fold and thrust belt, um, this is pretty good. So if we just have a look at the cross sections from the two areas, uh, one of the biggest differences between the two is the basement profile. Um, so this area has been interpreted to have this flat base uh, whereas here you get this sort of uh, subsidence of the basement and you, and you focus deformation in this narrower zone. Um, you'll, these have the same horizontal scale. Uh, so the full and thrust belt here is a good 20 to 40 kilometers wider uh, than this one over here. And if we have a look at some of the models, uh, there you go. Uh, so in the models, we're not exactly trying to replicate everything happening in the subandian zone. Uh, where a whole assortment of different processes contribute to the structural style. Uh, we're just looking at the overall big picture as, as it relates to isostasy. Um, so I'll just let these play through. Uh, and the only difference between the two models is just how pronounced the, the isostasy condition is. And they go for just over 10 million years. So yeah, one thing to look at is the basement profile and, and how it bends. Uh, and then the increase in structural complexity uh, where the bend is, uh, opposed to the more simple uh, structural peaks you get here over this flat basement. Uh, another first order difference is just how wide the folding thrust belt is. Uh, you can see for the same amount of shortening, it's more wide here than it is over here. Um, and here we have this low elastic thickness. We also, well, it's been interpreted in terms of spheric elastic thickness, uh, but we form the folding thrust belt over more ductile crust. Um, these are some mafix and magmatics that come in. Um, so we have this ductile lower crust that can respond uh, to, to the thickening above. Here, things are more rigid. Uh, it's been interpreted to have a really strong lithosphere. So we don't get much of the flexure of the, of the basement area. Um, and so we get these more simple structural repeats. And again, in the Andes, these aren't the only processes, um, but this is just a part of the overall bigger picture. And I'm just going to rapid fire a few other example of areas that might demonstrate these sorts of processes. Um, here's an example from the Macron accretionary wedge. Uh, so this runs from the southeast edge of the Zagros Mountains in Iran uh, all the way to the Pakistan border and forms due to the convergence between Arabia and Eurasia. Um, and this is just a seismic profile uh, across parts of the Macron wedge and its interpretation below. Uh, we have a relatively straight but inclined basin pro profile uh, here in the full thrust belt area without any crazy flexure. Um, and we form these structures over a more rigid crust. Um, and this is just one of our models that nearly matches it in scale. Um, and we use a relatively rigid lithosphere here, so we don't get much isostasy either, uh, but we do get some deflection. So we form this wide fold and thrust belt with a relatively low complexity, uh, you know, composed of these nice forward propagating thrust sheets, similar to what we see in the Macron wedge, uh, because we don't form these narrow zones of subsidence where we have like really intense focus deformation. Um, and here's another example from the Cordilleran fold and thrust belt deep, deep in the foreland. Um, so this cross section is out of Montana, uh, up near the Canadian border, uh, and it's known for its classic thin skin tectonics. Uh, you can see in the cross section, there's no real basement involvement. Um, you have this nice gentle slope towards the hinterland. And within this sort of context, it makes more sense to use an elastic beam formulation uh, at the base. So, so that's what we're using in the model above. Um, and just over that, that rigid base, we, we do get some of the flexure, but, but the structural styles uh, aren't really due to, to the changes in flexure. Um, and this is just one more real world example uh, before we wrap it up. Uh, here we're looking at the young Jura fold and thrust belt. Uh, the southeast side here is in Switzerland and we're moving northwest away from the mountains over the border into Germany. Um, and here we're overlying a relatively ductile crust. Uh, the Jura has been reported in having really low convergence rates uh, and it's a lot younger, so we have better constraints on that sort of thing. Um, and uplift rates are also pretty low. We're looking at about 0.05 millimeters per year. Um, and this is just one of the models you saw earlier where we have a really high isostatic rate. We get a lot of that isostatic subsidence. Um, yeah, and you saw this model earlier. I've just flipped it uh, so it better matches this profile. 
And you can see some of the same processes at work. Uh, subsidence, where we have most of the thickening, uh, deformation focused in this narrow zone, we have these complex structures forming and not much happening further up. Uh, so we've looked at a whole bunch of different things, um, but some of the main ideas I hope I got across was that uh, incorporating this un well understood, well known process of isostasy uh, is definitely more complicated than you would expect in a numerical model that just covers the upper crust. Um, the other point I wanted to get across was, well, the style of isostasy depends on the sort of geodynamic context we're in, uh, specifically for the structure. I mean, if you just need like an isostatic model to calculate accommodation space or, or something, uh, you can get away with whatever model your area has been interpreted in, like a uh, lithospheric elastic thickness map. Um, but when, when looking at the structure and formation of these structures, uh, why we might form this set of structures over another set of structures, how we get our isostasy becomes important. Do we have this gentle, rigid flexure of the lower crust uh, where the basement retains a flat profile? Or do we have more narrow areas of flexure or subsidence where the ductile lower crust uh, is able to get out of the way uh, to make space for the thickening above? Uh, so if you're working in this sort of foreland region, uh, it's probably better suited for, for an elastic beam sort of boundary condition. Uh, if you're working closer to the hinterland, say over here, or over here, uh, you probably want to think about a condition where you can get some redistribution of mass um, in, in that sort of beam area uh, of, the, of the isostasy condition, something closer to, to our local style um, isostasy condition. So uh, from the models, we, we've seen that isostasy could have strong implications on the structure of fold and thrust belt, depending on the geodynamic context. Uh, for a colder, more rigid lithosphere, it might not be so important uh, because the gentle incline associated with rigid elastic flexure uh, does not result in areas where you really narrow deformation. Uh, but where the style of isostasy is more dynamic and we get reorganization of material underneath the fold thrust belt, uh, we get this interplay between convergence velocity and flexural isostasy uh, in the structure of a fold and thrust belt. Uh, where we have a fast and aggressive tectonic environment coupled with a slower isostatic response. We get these really tall and wide fold and thrust belts made up of simpler in sequence structural repeats. Uh, when we had a more gentle tectonic regime that isostasy could keep up with, we would get less broad but more narrow fold and thrust belts with lower elevations, but with relatively high structural complexity uh, in the narrower zones of deformation. Uh, so in terms of future work in this sort of space, uh, we're taking closer look at the isostasy condition uh, in different geodynamic contexts, all with the upper crust. Uh, up there, I've got a rift sort of model. Uh, and down here, I've got a glacier melting. Um, and we're looking at uh, the different conditions we're using our local isostasy condition, uh, the lithospheric flexure condition, uh, now that we've coupled underworld with G-flex, thanks to all of Julian's help, um, and, and another pressure traction condition that I didn't show today. Uh, so this is just you know, a little teaser for my next presentation down the line.